Yep, I think it's safe to say that falling from any height can be really dangerous, but especially when you've tumbled out of an airplane, and worse, without a parachute. Now, the trick here is to create drag to slow your descent. Use your shirt, pants, or do an air snow angel. Anything to slow you down a little bit. But hey, you've always wanted to make an impact, right? Well, check this out. A Yugoslavian woman was working as a flight attendant. She survived an incredible fall on January 26, 1972, after the plane she was working on exploded. Falling from a height of 33,000 feet, she managed to survive but spent the next year and a half recovering after waking up from her coma. Experts disagree on the right way to land, but there's definitely a wrong way – landing on your head. Do you remember the rule of three for us squishy human beings? Uh, That's you and me, by the way. Three minutes without oxygen, three days without water, three weeks without food. It's a great guideline, but some people manage to stretch it out a bit further. If watching a sunset, smelling flowers, or ordering that big juicy hamburger is important to you, well, you'd better start thanking that delightful gas, oxygen. Don't believe me? Try doing even one of those things without it. Two minutes without oxygen will cause the average human to pass out. After 10 minutes, well, there isn't usually a comeback to her. This varies, of course, from person to person, depending on their fitness levels. But we love to push the boundaries as humans, don't we? The longest someone held their breath for was an outstanding 24 minutes, 3.45 seconds, give or take. That's 100 times longer than the first airplane flight. Take that, Wright Brothers! Alex Segura Vendrell from Spain pushed the limits of breath-holding in 2016 by floating in a controlled pool environment. Just before going under, he was gulping in air like a fish to try to get as much oxygen as possible. Strangely, holding your breath underwater is easier than trying it on dry land. Swimming activates your diver's reflex, slowing down our heart rate and metabolism. Not only is oxygen important, so is precious H2O, a hand-tasty food. Each cell in our body needs water to survive. If we can't replace the water loss quickly, we only have about three days to a week before it's all over. How humid the air is, our age, physical activity, and health play a huge part in water retention in our bodies. When we're running low on water, the important areas of our body, like the heart and brain, pull water from wherever it can. Like a sponge, these organs soak up everything until there's nothing left. In 1979, an Austrian man in a holding cell lasted 18 days without water. He allegedly licked condensation off the prison walls to stay hydrated. What's the scariest thing in the universe? The fridge is empty! Where's all the food? (laughs) Without any calories, your body starts to feed on itself. Not exactly the diet I had planned for this year. During the first few days, our carbohydrate reserves are turned into glucose. When that's all used up, our body starts to target fat, muscle, and other proteins, all the way down to the bones. Fasting is a common way to let our bodies use those extra reserves inside of us. Mahatma Gandhi's longest of many fasts lasted 21 days. The longest known fast was when a 27-year-old lived off water and vitamin supplements for 382 days and shrank from 456 to 180 pounds. Yow! Our bodies are equipped to survive without food for long periods. Our ancestors didn't exactly have a supermarket to go to. This makes us pretty good at dealing with starvation. We humans can cope with many extreme survival situations. But how long can you swim in freezing water without turning into a popsicle? What happens if you're stuck in the desert or at the top of a mountain? Climbing the peaks of the world, like the Rocky Mountains, the Swiss Alps, or even Mount Everest, is challenging on a good day. But the real danger is altitude sickness. It affects about half of all climbers. Starting at roughly 1.5 miles up, the lack of oxygen can cause dizziness, tiredness, and headaches for some. Others can even get insomnia. This is just the start of a whole bunch of symptoms that affect our bodies. Consciousness becomes a big problem for most people at 3 miles up without proper preparation. Ascending too quickly can even lead to fluid in your lungs or even worse. 
The thing about altitude sickness is that it doesn't care if you're old or young, male or female, a couch potato, or an athlete. Everest is 5.5 miles high and the ultimate challenge for climbers. It's like hiking up 20 Empire State Buildings or two times the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Austrian Felix Baumgartner pushed the altitude tolerance limit on October 14, 2012. He jumped from 128,000 feet up. That's nearly 24 miles. It's no surprise that he's also the first skydiver to go faster than the speed of sound, reaching a mind-boggling 833 miles per hour. He definitely had the right equipment, like a pressure suit with oxygen and safety checks in place, which goes to show you, if you're going up high, remember the five Ps. Proper planning prevents poor performance. Surviving extreme heat isn't just about the temperature. Humidity is the real danger to us. The less humid the air is, the more water stays where it belongs, in our body. Ever walked into the sauna and realized that it's over 230 degrees? That's so hot and humid, you'd probably only last about 3 to 4 minutes max. Wait, humans can't melt, right? Above 104 degrees, there's a real chance of heat stroke. It doesn't sound like a big change from our usual body temperature, but it is. Just imagine getting caught in a desert for a few days. And not just any desert, the world's hottest. The hottest temperature ever recorded on Earth was in Nevada, a crazy 134 degrees. Cooling way down really quickly can help relieve cramps, headaches, and even nausea. But breathing can become kind of impossible once your organs start to shut down and hypothermia sets in. As soon as our bodies drop below our natural body temperature, our muscles start to stiffen. That's why you stop feeling cold and pain after a while. There just aren't any nerve endings functioning anymore. Shivering quickly to produce heat is our body's natural way to keep our organs warm. This only works for cold air, though. In cold water, shivering drains your body heat even faster. If you've never heard of the 300 Club, you're not alone. A base in Antarctica has found a great way to test the extreme limits of the human body in the most peculiar way. Participants at the station warm up in the sauna, which is heated to 200 degrees. Then they pull on their boots and run outside, where it's minus 100. Not only do they have to endure the 300-degree temperature change, but they've also got to run around the South Pole before coming back to the sauna to warm up again. Oh, am I tired? Time for a little snooze. Sleep is very important. Maybe that's why getting out of bed in the morning is so tough. We need sleep to recharge our body from the long day we've just had, leaving us refreshed and alert when we hear that alarm. Our brain can turn all fuzzy without enough sleep, and a good 8 hours is perfect for a healthy immune system. Sleeping improves our memory, our heart, and puts us in a better mood for the day. Randy Gardner and his friends tried to test the limits of staying awake. It was for their science fair project. They managed to stay awake and functioning for 11 days and 25 minutes. Even when tested during and after the experiment, Randy could play basketball and had no abnormal brain waves. Now, it's almost impossible to calculate the exact g-force that would harm a human. That's because there are three types of g-force out there – side to side, up and down, and forward and backward. The danger lies in how long we have to sit there while we're being thrown around like a rag doll. The longer we sit there, the more it affects our bodies. We experience g-force at home simply by sitting down on the couch too quickly, sneezing, or having someone slap our back a little too hard. Pilot John Stapp demonstrated that a human can withstand over 40 g's. That's nearly 10 times the amount an average racing driver feels. The experiment only went on for a few seconds, but for an instant, his body weighed almost 7,000 pounds. Survival isn't always about taking on the elements. Sometimes, it's fighting against time. The current record for the longest living human is Gene Kalman, who was born in 1875. Danger might await you anywhere. Scammers are getting more sophisticated in their attempts to get closer to you and use their skills to scam you. They use strange things like envelopes in the car and other weird stuff on the hood to target everyone, regardless of their age and background. 
Let's see how you can recognize the red flags and know what to do. It's late evening. You park your car in the supermarket's lot, lock it, and go shopping. When you return, you see someone has wrapped a shirt around one of your windshield wipers. Don't pause to get the piece of clothing off your windshield if this really happens to you. Instead, get into your car as quickly as possible and drive away. Find a well-lit spot, preferably with other people around, and only then stop and toss the shirt out. It's a relatively new trick criminals use to distract lonely drivers' attention. The shirt or other sizable piece of cloth makes you stop and pull it off. While you're doing this, they can sneak up on you, and who knows what happens then. If you have shopping bags on you, it's best not to open your trunk either, as it also makes you vulnerable to prowlers and prevents you from acting fast. Toss the bags into the car and sort them out later when you're safe. What might be sending even more shivers down your spine is finding an envelope inside your car when you return to it. You definitely locked it, so someone was able to break in. First of all, remember basic security and drive off immediately. Then, best toss the envelope without opening it. There might be something nasty inside for all you know. But suppose your curiosity took the upper hand and you still opened it. In that case, you might find a message inside that says something like, Dear sir, madam, we've tested your car's security and found it unsatisfactory. As you can see, your car can easily be broken into. We expect you to pay us for this test, and in return, we'll make sure to send someone to help you install a better security system. Well, it's good they've taken nothing, so toss the envelope away and disregard the message. If you pay scammers, they're likely to do it again, or even try something worse. The best you can do is go to a trusted car service and check your security system on your own, or even replace the one you have if you're not sure of its capabilities anymore. A water bottle on your car's hood is a sign you're in grave danger. Like a clothing item on your windshield wipers, it's meant to distract you and make you get out of the car. But this case is even worse. Even if you don't go out to remove the bottle or any other relatively large and distracting object and drive home immediately, you might be up for something terrible. People who put the bottle on your car's hood might have installed a GPS tracker on your car. So driving home puts you at risk of them following you there. You should either find a safe spot with many people around and check your car for the tracker, or go straight to the nearest police station and ask them to do it for you. When a stranger asks you to take a picture of them and gives you a phone, don't be too quick to take it. Look at them first. If they look suspicious or unfriendly, it's better to refuse the request nicely. This might be a fraud. They give you the phone, you turn on the camera and see that it's broken. The image in the photo is damaged. You give the stranger their phone back and they accuse you of breaking the phone. They demand money and start making a scene. In such a situation, it's better not to panic and not to be provoked. Calmly leave. Make it clear that you won't fall for this. And if they behave too aggressively, then call the police. Thieves can put an advertising flyer, a newspaper, or a sticker on your house or apartment door. You can find a piece of paper or a thin strip from a plastic bottle in the doorway. If you don't remove one of these items for a long time, then the thieves understand that you're not at home. This way, thieves mark buildings and apartments that are easy to get into. After all, getting into an empty apartment is much safer. So as soon as you see a foreign object, immediately get rid of it. If a flyer or bookmark hangs on the door for one or two days, it tells the thief that no one's home. Of course, these can be real advertising stickers, but you still don't need them. In addition to flyers, there may be strange labels on the house or apartment door, numbers, crosses, or other symbols. It's how burglars mark houses they're about to break into. If you see such a sign, it's better to call the police. You're driving home from work and suddenly notice you're almost out of gas. That's weird because you recently filled a full tank. You go to the gas station and to the car repair center to check if there is a gas leak in the vehicle. Meanwhile, robbers can take things out of your house. They deliberately drain the fuel from your car so that you'd go to the gas station. They detain you and buy time to clean out your home. 
If you're sure that you refueled recently and the gas was drained from you, you should call your neighbors and ask them to monitor your house or apartment. Burglars might stage some accident to lure you out of your house. Please don't fall for it. If there is actually some accident, it's always better to call 911. Also, beware of weird calls when someone calls you and keeps silent. If they started bothering you quite often, it could be a sign that your house is now a burglar's target and they want to check if you're home. Always make sure that the taxi meter is working when you get into a cab. If you take a seat and the driver tells you the meter is broken, you'd better get out at once and call another car. You could get charged much more than the regular fee without the meter, especially if you're not a local. Your car's broken down in the middle of an interstate, so you call a towing service. But in less than five minutes, a tow truck stops by and the driver offers you help. It's best to reject the offer politely. Granted, you'll have to wait longer, but at least you won't be overcharged. There are towing companies that take advantage of unfortunate drivers stranded in the middle of nowhere. This kind stranger might take your car prisoner until you pay double the regular charge. If you're not sure the tow truck that's arrived at your help is the one you called for, call the service again and ask for the number on the license plate. When you choose a parking spot, it's best to avoid those next to larger vehicles than yours. They block your line of sight, and you can quickly become the target for someone with bad intentions hiding behind the van or truck next to your car. When someone calls you and says they're representing your bank, be aware that bank employees will never ask you for your account information, including your PIN or a one-time code sent to your phone. If someone asks you for that, best hang up and call the bank on your own. Just use the number on its website. Paying with your bank card or through the e-wallet via a trusted service is the only safe way to pay online. If a company asks you specifically to pay in an unusual way, such as a gift card, a voucher, or a transfer to another bank card through your online banking app, mark it as a huge red flag for scammers. A real company wouldn't make you do that, and they'll also provide you with an electronic check afterward. You're walking down the street and hear a familiar buzzing. You're so scared, you sweat and stop. The next second, you notice a yellow beetle with black stripes. The smell of your sweat attracted this bug. It's like nectar to it. No worries though, it can't bite you. The only thing this bug can do is lick you. And no, it's not a bee. This is a hoverfly, a kind of flies. Unlike bees, bumblebees, and wasps, it's harmless. But this is not the only reason why you shouldn't squish it. Hoverflies pollinate plants around them, just like bees. They're crucial for nature's life cycle. The larvae of these beetles are indispensable helpers in any garden. They feed on aphids and other flower pests. When still a larva, one hoverfly can eat about 400 aphids. Imagine how many parasites thousands of larvae can destroy. These kind and harmless insects have no chance of resisting their enemies, birds and predatory insects. So they developed an amazing deceptive way of protection. Hoverflies are actors in the world of bugs. They learned to mimic the appearance of bees and wasps to instill fear in those who want to eat them. Many animals and insects know how painful a wasp can bite, so they are wary of them. When a spider, a mantis, or a bird notices hoverflies, they are afraid to approach because they think it's a bee. But appearance alone is not enough, so these amazing flies can move like bees. Some species imitate a bite, flying towards the enemy, pretending they have a bee sting. Some hoverflies also raise their front paws above their heads to make them look like bees' antennas. Their behavior is sending a clear message to prospective enemies. Don't get closer. I'm a wasp, and I'm going to sting you. But the coolest thing about rare types of hoverflies is their annoying hum. They make a sound resembling the buzzing of bees and scare away foes more effectively. Bees don't fight hoverflies. They pollinate flowers together and drink nectar. So don't squish it. 
it's not going to do you any bad. By the way, even if a bee or a wasp are flying nearby, don't try to hit them. Most likely, you won't catch them with the first hit, which will make the bugs angry. Just be calm, and the bee will fly away. Another insect you shouldn't crush is the ladybug. First, it's beautiful, and it can be yellow, orange, red, gray, and black. Not all of them have spots. Second, it doesn't pose any danger to you. But the main reason to keep ladybugs safe is that they feed on aphids and many other soft-bodied insect pests. So, they can be a great help in the garden. The green lacewing is a tiny, fragile insect with transparent wings that resembles a miniature alligator because of its green color. Adult lace wings aren't that useful. They feed on nectar and make your garden more beautiful with their good looks. But at an earlier stage of life, these insects are effective aphid exterminators. That's why lace wings larvae are called aphid lions. They also eat ticks and eggs of other insect pests. Bees are considered to be the most useful bugs in the world. According to some studies, they pollinate about 80% of fruits, vegetables, grains, and nuts in the U.S. In one day, one bee can pollinate a huge number of flowers and trees. They also produce honey. According to research, honey is a product with an unlimited shelf life. Scientists have discovered an ancient Egyptian tomb and found plates with edible honey in there. Bees are absolutely necessary for our planet. About a third of the world's food production requires bee pollination. Cows eat vegetation that bees pollinate. And if there were no bees, it would greatly affect the health of all the world's cattle. A lot of fruits and berries would lose their taste if the bees stopped fertilizing them. We get most of the cotton on the planet thanks to pollination by these insects. There would be a shortage of genes if the bees disappeared. The taste of many products would deteriorate and the food would likely lose its useful properties. So, think twice before swatting at a bee. These bugs look like huge mosquitoes. They have long paws and a thin proboscis. Don't squish them. They are crane flies, some of the most harmless and gentle insects on the planet. They mostly live near water and close to large vegetation in moist places. They don't bite anyone with their long proboscis, but use it to feed on the plant's nectar. Some species don't have a mouth and proboscis at all. They don't eat anything and live a short life. They use fat reserves they have accumulated while they were larvae. Some people believe if you see this insect, it's a sign the frosts are over and spring will come soon. You shouldn't catch them because they are an important element in nature. Many frogs, birds, spiders, fish, and insects feed on crane flies. It's better to let a crane fly be someone's lunch than crush it. A house centipede is a pretty terrifying insect to encounter. This long creature with 15 pairs of long legs can live in your bathroom or even bedroom. But don't touch it. A centipede is a helpful neighbor. It preys on small insect pests, controls the population of cockroaches, midges, flies, termites, and other bugs. A centipede won't appear in your house just like that. It comes only if there's some crawling food for it in the room. You can squish it and relax for a while, but then small pests will arrive at your house. If you give a centipede a chance, it will destroy all unwanted guests and leave. These creatures are solitary predators and won't start a colony or build a nest on your bed. They don't carry any diseases either. And of course, they won't be the first to attack you. Most likely, they'll just run away if you scare them. By the way, they run fast. Other friendly but scary looking neighbors you might have are spiders. They catch bed bugs, mosquitoes, flies, and other small insects. If you have a black widow or some other poisonous species in your house, it's better to call a pest control service to get rid of those monsters. Mantises are quite helpful creatures. They hunt insects that spoil your flowers and do it so effectively. They can exterminate entire colonies. They can control the population of some bugs. Many people buy mantises and release them in their gardens. A brown marmorated stink bug isn't helpful or too friendly, so you'd better not touch it. These bugs emit an awful smell when they sense any danger. Squishing them has the same effect. This is a pretty effective way to defend against enemies for these creatures. Stink bugs are pests and aren't welcome in any home. To get rid of them, use a vacuum cleaner or a bowl of soapy water. Throw a bug there and the soap will stop the unpleasant smell and minimize damage to your smell receptors. 
earwigs are not as nasty as you might think. And no, they don't crawl into your ears to lay eggs there. This is a common myth that turned them into dangerous enemies for many people. In reality, they're your friends and helpers. Earwigs have forceps, but they use them for defense, not attack. Don't touch this insect if you see it in your garden, because it helps to dispose of rotten leaves, herbs, and plants. Earwigs are scavengers. If you found them in your apartment, then carefully use a piece of paper to throw it outside. You're unlikely to see peacock spiders in your house because they live in the forests of Australia. But if you happen to run into one, don't try to squish it. These tiny creatures are the size of a grain of rice. They are poisonous, but their jaws can't bite through human skin. So, they are harmless. They have a multicolored pattern similar to peacocks. They use it not to scare some enemies, but to attract female spiders. They dance to mate and have offspring. In total, there are about 50 species of peacock spiders, and they all dance differently. They lift their buttocks, shake them, and tap their paws on the floor. They are some of the cutest spiders in the world. They belong to the jump spiders family, which means they don't spin webs. Instead, they stalk their prey like a leopard, then jump on it and inject venom. They can attack a prey three times bigger than their size. Imagine you're hanging out somewhere in the forests of Australia. You're thirsty, so you go to the nearest stream. Suddenly, you feel that you have a runny nose. It's strange because you're perfectly healthy. You stop and wait. A few seconds pass. Your nose is itching. A few minutes pass. Your eyes are watering. Your throat is going crazy. You can't breathe freely, and you're constantly sneezing. It seems you're breathing poisoned air. But what's poisoning it? The smallest particles of the most dangerous plant in the world are flying around you. It's called Gimpy Gimpy. There it is. It looks ordinary. A small bush with green stems and leaves. The closer you come, the worse you're feeling. You need more air, and your skin is turning red. It physically hurts you to be here. You may lose consciousness if you stay here for a little bit more. Do you know what will happen if you touch this plant? Well, it will feel like red-hot needles penetrating your skin. And even if you run away as far as possible from here right now, the pain will not subside. The effects of the sting will last for several hours. Days will pass, and the pain will remain. Weeks and months will pass, but you'll still feel it. You can wash the touch area with cold water and soap, but this won't help a lot. It might not go away for several years. And all those tiny plant hairs that penetrated your skin can stay with you forever. The toxicity of Gimpy Gimpy is so high that even if you tear off one leaf and touch it after a year, it will still cause damage to your body. The bad news is that this plant is hard to spot. You can easily confuse it with burdock or nettle. Just imagine what will happen if someone falls into the bush. Its distinctive feature is a thin layer of fluff on each leaf. But be careful. This fluff consists of thousands of poisonous hairs. They also fly around the plant, so it's dangerous to be here without a gas mask. An ordinary medical mask won't help here, since the hairs can get through the fabric. The good news is, there aren't many of them around the world, and people usually put warning signs near them. This bad guy grows in Australia. Gold miners discovered this plant in 1860, near the town of Gympie. And something is telling me it wasn't the happiest discovery. Even now, Gimpy Gimpy poses a serious danger to loggers and tourists. You may accidentally touch it with your hand. One touch is enough to make you lose your working capacity for several weeks. In some cases, the affected area continues to hurt for decades. One man fell into the bush and lost his mind because of the pain. People compare a Gimpy Gimpy sting with a bite of 30 wasps at the same time. And you won't know how to get rid of it. One guy experienced an unpleasant feeling every time he took a shower for two years after touching this plant. If you want to study it, you need to wear a protective suit and a gas mask. There should be no open areas on your body. Tuck your pant legs into your boots, put on protective gloves, and move out into the forest. It grows on the edge, next to streams. Gimpy Gimpy is one of the six species of poisonous trees native to Australia. They love the sun and the vegetation around them. Every hair on the surface of the leaf is poisoned. 
When it contacts any surface, it opens and sprays a burning toxin. Then, the pain increases and the skin turns red. The duration of the effect depends on the number of hairs that penetrate your body. After a few years, you can put pressure on the bite site and feel the hairs are still there. There's no antidote because scientists still don't know what the toxic poison's components are. All they know is that the poison effect lasts a very long time, several years. It can withstand cold and hot temperatures. Water only enhances its effect. Botanical samples of this plant in laboratories are still dangerous, despite scientists keeping them for several years. After you have passed by Gimpy Gimpy, don't forget to disinfect yourself. Carefully remove clothes, shoes, masks, and glasses. Put a protective suit in the washing machine and wash everything else well. Tiny hairs can be in your pants or the sleeves of your jacket, so be careful. This toxicity makes Gimpy Gimpy the most protected plant in the world. But wait, what's that? Do you see these little holes on its leaves? It seems that someone is eating it. These are the usual nocturnal beetle species. They can devour Gimpy Gimpy all day long, as the poisonous hairs can't harm them. These bugs just don't care. Gimpy Gimpy is the perfect lunch, as no one can disturb these beetles while they're sitting on this plant. And yes, all the animals living nearby know that it's better not to get close to it. But there's one mammal that is not afraid of Gimpy Gimpy. It's a red-legged patamelon. It looks like a little kangaroo and loves to eat the Gimpy Gimpy leaves. Scientists still don't know what exactly protects this animal from toxic hairs. We know almost all the places where this plant grows. People mark them with signs. If you see one, just don't go there. Gimpy Gimpy is a terrible plant, but how about a plant that can take over the whole world and destroy all the crops? It doesn't need favorable conditions for growth. It can survive in the rain, in arid places under the scorching sun, at low and high temperatures. It's called the giant hogweed. If the seed of this plant gets into a vegetable bed or a wheat field, the plant will displace all competitors in a few weeks. The wind can blow on the giant hogweed seeds and spread them further to the nearest territories. This plant can worsen ecosystems around the world. It grows faster than people manage to destroy it. If you spray poison on the leaves, it doesn't even care. If you let parasitic beetles into giant hogweed territory, it doesn't care either. It multiplies very fast and lives longer than many plants. The giant hogweed can reach the height of a one-story huh? house and go deep underground with its roots. It's also dangerous to touch it with your hands. It can turn your skin red, and it won't feel good to say the least. That's how it's making it so hard to fight against it. This poison destroys any plants, bushes, and flowers nearby. Scientists still can't create an effective poison to combat this green monster. No beetles feed on it. That's why the giant hogweed is one of the most dangerous plants in the world. It simply has no enemies in nature. But scientists are sure that evolution will create some creatures capable of destroying the giant hogweed. It can be small bugs or parasitic bacteria. But until that happens, people have to fight this beast on their own. They spend millions of dollars trying to destroy the plant, but it doesn't always work out. You can burn a field, but if one seed remains, it will quickly grow on the scorched ground. You've seen some of the most dangerous plants in the world. But what about trees? A manchineel tree grows in Florida. Its trunk secretes toxic juice that's dangerous for your skin, but it gets much worse during the rain. When water falls on the bark, it mixes with the poison. Then, these poison drops can bounce off the tree and get on your skin. Leaves and fruits also have this toxin, so never hide under this tree in bad weather. Mushrooms, shrubs, and flowers don't grow near this tree either. Animals never come close to it. Birds never sit on its branches. Manchineel trees are resistant to water and high temperatures. Never try to burn it. The smoke released during combustion is toxic and dangerous to your eyes. The locals mark this tree with red circles. Ooh, you're in the heart of the Sahara Desert. You're going to take part in a marathon. From this point, you need to walk 600 miles east to the meeting point. You want to prove to yourself that you can survive in any conditions. Open sea, the icy lands of Antarctica, the Amazon jungle, you've been everywhere. 
And now it's the turn of the hot desert. The key to success in any journey is preparation. You take a large backpack filled with necessary stuff. A small hatchet for chopping off dry branches. A compass, a sleeping bag. You can't rely on GPS, as the connection may be lost in the desert. Matches, a first aid kit, water purification tablets, a flashlight. Also, you need a scarf, a bandana, sealed glasses that will protect your eyes from sand, and light clothing that can cover your entire body. A raincoat or a tent will also be useful. You need all this to protect your body from sand and sunlight. For the same reason, you pack gloves, too. You can't eat highly nutritious food. To digest it, your body needs a lot of energy and liquid, and those are the most important and sparse things in the desert. Diet bars or dried fruits are great options. Also, you need a lot of water. A lot of water. It's safer to take several smaller bottles than one large container. If this container gets damaged, you'll be left without water. And when you have several bottles, you reduce this risk. The backpack is filled and you're ready to start your journey. A helicopter takes you to the middle of the desert. First of all, you lubricate your nostrils with a moisturizing cream. This is necessary to prevent the mucous membranes from drying. Hot air can burn your nose, and you can't breathe through your mouth not to lose valuable moisture. You walk a few feet and stop. It would be a mistake to travel through such a hot place during the day. You'll start sweating and lose a lot of liquid, but your water reserves are limited. The ideal time for traveling is in the evening and during the night. At this time, it gets cold. You'll need to move more to keep warm. So you find an old fallen tree and tie an awning to it. You've created a shadow, which means your sleeping spot is ready. It's important to move as little as possible to save your energy. You open the map and pull out your compass. Then you check the route, look around, and study the desert landscape so you can navigate it more easily. You want to drink some water, but you stop yourself. It's better not to drink for 24 hours to make your body go into survival mode. You close your eyes and fall asleep. Sand is blowing in your face. You get up and see a sandstorm approaching you. The tree near which you've been sleeping seems too fragile. It won't withstand the storm. You urgently need some shelter. You put on your glasses, tie the scarf around your head, and moisten it to make breathing easier. If you didn't have a scarf, you'd need to cover your face with your hands. All parts of your body must be protected with clothing. Tiny grains of sand collide with your skin at great speed. Despite the protection, you feel some of them on your face. There is no shelter where you can hide nearby. It could be a large stone, a tree, but nothing. Now you need to find a hill. During the storm, the grains not only fly, but also bounce off the ground and one another. When you're on a hill, most sand grains fall down its slopes, and you remain more or less unscathed. You need to get to high ground as soon as possible, since it's hard to move in such conditions. You're losing too much energy. You even have to walk backward with your back turned to the wind to protect your face. The storm is getting stronger, but fortunately, you're already rising. You find yourself on a small sandy hill. You wrap your tent around your body and wait. Tired, you fall asleep again. A couple of hours pass. You open your eyes and hear silence. The storm is over. You remove the tent, shake off the sand, and inspect the territory. The evening is getting closer. The sun is no longer warm. You take out the compass with a map to check the route. But in the next moment, you find out the sandstorm has completely changed the surrounding landscape. It's difficult to navigate using the map when there are no familiar landmarks. You can easily stray off course and get lost. So you're not sure where to go. But you have water and food, and other people know approximately your location. In this case, it's better for you to stay where you are. They will start looking for you and, eventually, find you. You won't waste your energy and reserves, but you look at the compass, at the map, and decide to go east. You're here to complete the marathon, whatever it takes. The night is quite cold, but constant movement helps you stay warm. You check your pockets and find out that you've lost your matches during the storm. Then you see a dry tree ahead. You chop off some of its branches and tie them to your backpack. While walking, you leave markers on the sand. Those are branches with pieces of cloth tied to them stuck in the ground. This way, you can help rescuers find you if you don't get to the meeting point. It's dawn. The sun is scorching. 
You find another tree, create a shade using the tent, drink some water, and fall asleep. At night, you cut off the branches of the tree and again wander through the desert. It seems that you're lost. Your water is running out faster than planned. You're snacking on an energy bar, and your body demands even more water. The most important thing in this situation is to stay calm. Fear drains your energy. You try to imagine the desert as your home, and you know it perfectly. This gives you strength and confidence. You find the ruins of an old building and hide in its shadow. After that, you put the branches in one pile and set them on fire with a mirror. You need the fire so that rescuers notice the smoke. Unfortunately, there's no helicopter flying in the sky. You continue on your way the next night and discover that only one bottle of water is left. You try to eat as little as possible so that your body doesn't waste energy on digesting food. It makes you weaker. Now your goal is to replenish your supplies. To do this, you need to wait for dawn. Then you'll look at the sky, find the clouds, and go in that direction. Where there are clouds, there should be life and water. But very soon, you understand that the sun is too hot. You make a shadow again. Exhausted, you lie down and quickly fall asleep. The sun has changed its position and is now shining straight on you. Its heat wakes you up. You don't have any water left. You get up and look for some rocks or vegetation. You can get some liquid from grass, plants, or bushes. After rains, moisture remains under stones for a long time. Pick them up and check, but carefully. Scorpion snakes and spiders can hide there. Also, you need to look at the sand to find some animal or insect traces. Animals always go toward water sources, and you need to follow them. But be very attentive. Those can be traces of cheetahs or African wild dogs. You're too weak to defend yourself against them. You need to spot the animals from afar and wait for them to drink first. You find some footprints. A group of spotted hyenas is walking in the distance. You slowly follow them. They lead you to an oasis. You wait for a couple of hours for them to get enough to drink. Finally, they leave the place, and you can quench your thirst. Don't forget to throw purification tablets into the water. But even if you don't have them, you should drink anyway. In any case, it can't get any worse. Also, it's important not to drink a lot at once. Your body is exhausted and can't process a lot of liquid quickly. You drink slowly, in small sips. It feels as if you can do this for hours. Then, you eat and pour some water into your bottles. No longer hungry, feeling satisfied and happy, you fall asleep again. Some noise wakes you up. A helicopter! It's flying right over you! You scream and wave your hands, but the rescuers don't notice you. It's too late to make a fire. The helicopter is leaving! Think, think, you take out the mirror, catch a sunbeam, and direct it at the helicopter. Ah, the rescuers have noticed you! You're saved. You can turn ordinary matches into waterproof ones. Apply a thin coat of nail polish to the matches and let it dry. Once they're ready, they'll stay dry enough to start a fire, even if you drop the matches in the water. If you get lost somewhere during the winter and need a drink, then don't eat snow. It has much more air than water, so you won't even feel much more hydrated. Your body also wastes a lot of energy trying to eat it. Even worse, you might lower your body temperature and could even get sick. If you find yourself face-to-face with a coyote or a wolf, don't turn your back. Slowly retreat while facing the animal. This might only work for a single animal, though. If you meet a pack, then the most important thing is to make sure that they don't surround you. Back away towards a tree and press your back against it. Then choose the right moment and climb it as quickly as possible. Several layers of clothing will warm you better than one warm fur coat or down jacket. Air will be trapped between the clothing layers, insulating you and keeping your body warm. If you get lost in the woods, always try to sleep a little above the ground. You can lay on a layer of branches and leaves as a makeshift bed or stretch a hammock out between some trees. At night, the temperature drops and the ground becomes cold. Even if you build a fire, it could go out while you sleep, and the ground will be sapping your body heat. You're in a boat in the middle of the sea. No food, no fishing net, and you're hungry. It was supposed to be only a 3-hour tour. Well, guess what? You can catch fish with the help of shoelaces and any object – phone, watch, or keys. 
The shadow cast by the boat in the sea can attract fish, and a reflective object can work as bait. Tie your keys to your shoelaces and use them as a fishing rod. Even if a fish doesn't bite, activities like this are a good way to maintain a healthy mind on the open sea. A short meditation can save you from a panic attack. You need to focus on your breathing and try to slow it down. Your brain will quickly calm down and turn its focus away from the panic. Oxygen masks in airplanes work on the same principle. When you control your breathing, your attention is redirected away from whatever bad thing is happening. You can make a torch out of a log. Put a small log vertically, make a deep star-shaped cut on the top, put dry grass leaves and sticks inside. Once you're done, set fire to the log and watch it burn for up to 3 hours. This should work the same regardless of the size and type of wood. Now, if you meet an angry grizzly bear, never try to run away because the bear can easily outrun you. Instead, lie down and don't move. Grizzlies only usually attack when they see a threat, so they'll often leave you alone if you show them that you won't cause them any problems. This only works with grizzly bears, though. If a confrontation is unavoidable, back away slowly and use bear spray. If you don't have any, pepper spray will work similarly and should disorient the bear and scare it away. Or not. Don't eat berries or mushrooms in the forest if you don't know exactly what they are. They could be poisonous. If you have no other option, eat the inner bark of maples, birches, and pines to fill your stomach. Use a knife to cut away the rough outer bark and get to the softer white stuff. You can boil it to make it even softer, or cook it over an open fire to make a crunchy snack. And if you're really starving, you can look for ants. They might not be the most appetizing, but they're pretty nutritious. If you don't have a watch, you can use your fingers to find out how much time is left until sunset. Raise your hand so the inside of your palm is facing you. Your fingers should be between the sun and the horizon line. See how many fingers can fit in this space. The thickness of one finger equals about 15 minutes, so you can calculate the time left before sunset. If you're lost and need to build a fire to attract attention, throw in a lot of pine, cedar branches, columns, and any unnecessary rubber objects. Your fire will emit more black smoke, which makes it visible from afar. If you have no water in the desert but have some food, try to avoid eating for as long as you can. The more you eat, the more thirsty you'll get. The body needs liquid to digest food, so it'll use up what little you have. A person can live much longer without food than without water, so don't be afraid to stay hungry. Hey, you found a huge puddle of dirty water in the forest. If you're desperate for a drink, you can fill your bottle and filter it into drinking water. To clean it, make a rope of gauze or clothing. Put one end into the dirty bottle and the other one into the empty one. Before long, the clean water will flow into the empty bottle through the rope while the impurities are left behind. Before hiking, replace your regular shoelaces with paracord shoelaces. If you don't have enough rope, these laces can give you a few extra feet in a pinch. If you're lost in the forest and have nothing to warm you, then take dry leaves and grass from the ground and put it between two layers of clothing. This will help you stay warm for a long time. When you're lost in the desert, try to move as little as possible during the day. Find a shadow or create it from improvised materials and sit in the shade until dark. At night, you'll spend much less energy and use up less fluid while you walk. This will help you to avoid the risk of a heat stroke. If you fall through some ice, don't try to get out like you would in a pool. If you put your hands on the ice and try to push yourself out with your arms, it could crack and make you fall back into the water. You need to stretch your arms parallel to the ice surface and stretch your legs way back so they float in the water. In this horizontal position, start waving your legs as if you're swimming. Move your arms carefully without putting too much weight on the ice, and you should be able to escape. If you need to build a fire while it's too windy, here's what to do. Dig two holes next to each other and create a small underground tunnel between them. Make a fire in one of the pits. The wind can't extinguish it, and the fire gets its air through the second pit. This method is also useful if you need to build a fire without drawing attention. In the dark, this kind of fire won't be visible. 
Don't throw away or pop bubble wrap. Take it on a hike with you. It will protect you from the cold better than even a thick blanket would. Those tiny air bubbles are perfect insulation. Just put it in between layers of clothing, and it'll stop any warmth from escaping. The plastic it's made of is also waterproof, so it can stop you from getting wet, too. Swimming in the sea not far from the shore, you can easily get swept up in rip currents. If this happens, the most important thing to remember is not to swim against the current. This will only waste your strength and sap your energy, and you're unlikely to ever overpower an ocean current. Instead, try to swim sideways along the shore. Sooner or later, you should get out of the current, and then you can safely swim to the beach. If you're stuck in a falling elevator, don't try to jump at the moment of collision. Don't take a sitting position or stand either. You need to lie on the floor, facing the ceiling. Spread your legs as wide as possible, cover your face with one hand, and put the other hand behind your head for protection. You reduce the pressure on your body in this position when you fall. Ooh, you're lost! A rescue helicopter flies over the forest, but you don't have a flare and don't have time to build a fire. Use a small mirror or phone screen to reflect the sunlight. Aim the light beam towards the helicopter. Rescuers should notice the glare and fly over to save you. Whoa! What's going on? It's dark and smelly. You're wearing nothing but pants and a shirt. You're lying on a cold concrete floor. How did you get here? Suddenly, the lights switch on and you see a steel door in front of you and a screen. It turns on and a man in a mask tells you that you have one hour to escape six rooms to win your cash prize. You get up and go to the door to open it, but it's locked. Out of nowhere, spikes pop out of the walls and start closing in on you. You only have one minute to get out before they crush you. You look around the room trying to find a key. The person in the mask gives you a hint. The key is inside you. You freak out, assuming the worst. You check your pockets, but nothing. The spikes are getting even closer. You start tapping all of your clothes and feel some hard object in the shirt at your waist level. There's a hidden zipper in the hem, and the key is inside the tiny pocket. The spikes are only a few feet away from you, so you rush to the door and unlock it. You shut it behind you and find yourself in room number two. You see a living room and a kitchen, but the entire place is literally upside down. Everything is glued to the floor, which is the ceiling for you. The exit is just across the room, but you need to find the key somewhere. You look around and stand on your tiptoes, reaching for a high stool in the kitchen, tugging on it to detach it. The stool gives in with a pop, and you smack on the floor with it. As if on cue, things start falling from the ceiling on their own. Small ones at first, some cutlery, a fruit basket. But then you see larger objects start slightly shaking. If that wardrobe falls on top of you, you shiver and scan the room for clues. You grab the stool, run into the living room, and stand on the stool to reach between the cushions of the couch there. Nothing. Suddenly, the couch creaks and one of its ends detaches from the ceiling. You fall down from fright and hear a crash from the kitchen. The counter has just collapsed on the floor. You look around wildly and a coat hanger with a jacket on it catches your eye. You run up to it just in time to dodge the couch crashing on the floor behind you. You find the key in the inside pocket. You cross the room, open the door, and slam it shut behind you, just as a large wardrobe falls on the floor, smashing to pieces. Room number three is very hot and humid. You're in an indoor tropical jungle. Right in front of you is your first obstacle, quicksand. You leap as far as you can to cover some ground and land inches away from the other side. You're ankle deep in sand, but quickly pull down to your waist. You flail your arms in panic and one of them touches a vine above your head. You grab hold of it and pull yourself out to safety. Phew, that was close. When you get up, you're at the edge of a shallow canyon with a fast running river below. There are three vines dangling from the ceiling in front of you. You tug on each of them, but it's not enough to check if they're going to hold your weight. You find a heavy rock and tie it to one of the vines. Swing, snap! The vine breaks and the rock splashes into the water. No more big rocks around, so you have to make your choice. 
you close your eyes, swing from another vine, and it also snaps, sending you right into the river. The flow is taking you to what looks like a waterfall. You look around in panic and notice some roots sticking out from the other bank. You grab a hold of them in a last minute effort and pull yourself out of the water. Breathing heavily, you raise your head and see the door to the next room just a few steps away. You walk to it on wobbly legs. It opens automatically. Room number four is filled with hay. You read a sign on the wall that says, finding the key is like finding a needle in a haystack. Huh. As you look around the room, there's a click in the distance, and you trace the sound to a long fuse that just got sparked. Oh great, it's the other end that's buried in a large haystack. Once the flame reaches the stack, the whole place will become an oven. You hectically rummage in the hay. You're still drenched and sweating profusely to boot, so the stuff sticks to you like glue. Throwing heaps of it around, you stumble upon something big and heavy. A metal detector! You grab it and start searching. A couple of minutes pass before you hear the detector's beep. The fuse is inches away from the haystack. You dig through the hay and get a hold of the key. You rush to the door just as the stack catches on fire. A mighty whoosh and the door shuts behind you. You're safe. The fifth room is completely dark. You start walking, holding your hands in front of you. After a dozen steps, a bright spotlight comes on and you squeeze your eyes tight. You're standing on a platform made up of nine square panels and there's a basketball hoop at a throwing distance. You can't get closer. There's a gap between you and the hoop. And lying at your feet are five basketballs. A display lights up above the hoop, saying you're zero out of three. So you have to get three balls into the hoop to get further. You grab one and toss it. The ball hits the hoop and rebounds into the gap, disappearing into the darkness. Then a metallic roar comes from behind you. And when you look around, you see three of the panels at the rear have fallen down into the chasm. You gulp down and take the second ball. A toss? Nailed it! The ball falls right into the hoop, and the counter changes from one out of three. The third ball goes right on the mark as well, so you only have one left to make it to the next room. Confident, you throw the fourth ball and miss altogether. The second row of panels behind you falls into the abyss and you only have the last ball. Sweating and shaking, you throw the ball. It hits the hoop and starts rolling around it. You see it as if it's in slow motion, and then it falls inside. You've made it! The hoop goes down and more panels rise before you, paving the way to the door that opened on the other side. You collect yourself and walk to the last room. Waiting for you there is an obstacle course. This time, the door is wide open, but a countdown begins and the door is slowly closing. You muster all the energy you have left and sprint across the course. You ace the monkey bars, jump from panel to panel, crawl through a tunnel and scale a wall. You can't feel your arms and legs, but you finally make it. You slide down right into the exit. You end up in some basement, empty except for a table with a lamp and a thick envelope on it. You open the envelope and find $10,000 in cash inside, as well as a handwritten note. It says, Thank you for playing my little game. If you ever want to do it again, just call me. As you read the last word, the light goes off and you only hear a hissing noise before you lose consciousness. You wake up in your own bed and startle up, looking around wildly. Was it all a dream then? But then, you notice the envelope on your bedstand. The money's there, and the note as well. And on the other side of the note, there's a phone number. You shiver, but put the note away into the drawer. Maybe one day.